Europe's energy crisis is getting out of control. It's expected that this winter will cost Europe about two trillion more than past winters. But really the focus of today is to help you understand and conceptualize what is going on in Europe and how this is gonna spread throughout the rest of the world, how it affects global supply chains, and what you can do with your own portfolio to potentially position yourself in a proper way. So basically what you wanna understand currently with Europe before we go into these three main categories is Europe has been heavily, heavily reliant on cheap, abundant Russian gas flowing through the nation. They've kind of gone through this switch from fossil fuels to ESG, fossil fuels, you know, oil, coal to ESG, which is renewables, wind, and solar. But the problem is the bridge technology here was this reliance on gas, right? So this is gonna be the bridge technology to bring them to this, this net neutral um, carbon zero future. Um, and the problem here is they kind of back themselves in this corner where now we're actually seeing a lot of these headlines where you know we're seeing lines in Germany and Poland to stock up on firewood for the winter. We're seeing a bunch of places having to go back to coal, having to turn back on nuclear plants. And um, it's very interesting, right? So they're kind of scrambling in this last minute, but sadly they just don't have the infrastructure in place to do this properly. So we're gonna focus on solutions in this video, but these three main categories that I wanna cover will first be the current situation in Europe, kind of understanding the macro backdrop, what you need to know moving forward. Then we're going to how Europe's electricity grid is actually made up, how they actually find the price of electricity and why a lot of these European leaders actually met on September 9th, um, just a few days ago in Brussels to tackle this issue of separating gas and electricity prices. I'm gonna cover that and explain that to you in a very easy to understand way. That'll be the second thing. And then the last thing will be the solutions and this new global energy paradigm. So firstly, what is going on here in Europe currently? And how do we kind of get through this winter, right? And one of the crazy things that's actually happened was this $1.5 trillion in margin calls currently. So electricity companies basically shorted the price of gas just uh, at the end of August here. It's very, very insane. Um, when they decided to short this, basically meaning they would make money when the price goes down, um, they're trying to hedge their bets, the price went up. So basically they have $1.5 trillion in margin calls. That's about three times larger than the Lehman Brothers claps. Pretty insane. Um, you know, companies that are already in that space, just gambling, um, not making the situation any better. But to really understand what's been going on here throughout the past decades, um, you have the East, which is supplying all these goods to the West demand, right? The West are kind of the consumers, the East are the suppliers. Um, this was kind of a proper balance until really earlier this year, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of other things, but this is kind of a simplified version. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, basically, European Union, America basically stepped in and went, hey, we're gonna sanction Russia, and we're basically gonna kind of weaponize um, the dollar and these different things to make it harder for Russia to trade, harder for Russia to do business internationally. Um, when they did this, Russia said, hey, great, we're just gonna cut off the gas supplies. We're gonna have these kind of scheduled maintenance uh, breaks in, in these different pipelines, Nord Stream kind of being the, the most kind of infamous one of them shutting down completely. It was about 20% capacity. But it's interesting now to analyze the situation because what is the incentive for Russia to turn back on the gas supplies? Well, not really anything, unless the US decides to lift these sanctions. Um, there's just no reason for Russia to supply this gas. Russia could supply about one sixth of the gas um, that they did last January and make the exact same amount of money in 2023 and sell the other five, six, you know, off to other countries. So they're in a very, very good situation. That's kind of what we're understanding now is the, the West has kind of been a lot of this economic growth kind of future forward thinking um, where the East has kind of been stockpiling goods, stockpiling commodities, which is going to be the most important thing, especially, um, you know, in this kind of great recession. So you understand that, right? Kind of this East-West balance. And the, especially Europe has really relied on this cheap, abundant Russian gas in their industries. Um, now this is not the case anymore. They've kind of backed themselves in this corner, kind of condemning nuclear, which nuclear was really the best option that they should have invested in the most. It's really the cleanest source of a base state energy, meaning that it's always 24 seven going. Um, I'll talk about this more in the solution section, but one of the problems with renewables is they're actually intermittent, right? So that means that you're gonna actually need a secondary power source to run when let's say the wind goes down or the sun is, when it's cloudy and the sun is not there. Um, so it's, it's not something that's a, a base state like nuclear. Um, then, then you have other things obviously that you can go to um, like gas. We'll talk about liquefied natural gas, the shipping implications there um, in the solution section. But as long as you kind of understand the overall picture of you know, Europe is not in a good situation now. They've kind of backed themselves in this corner. They're having to kind of uh, re-say re a lot of these things that they've gone where, you know, we're gonna close down nuclear plants, close down coal plants. Now they're having to reopen them. Uh, so it's been interesting to kind of see in this transition. It'll be fascinating to watch what happens in the United States as well. Um, but winter is coming, that is for sure. So moving on to the next thing is Europe's electricity grid. How is this actually made up? Now, this is very, very interesting. You have the generators, you have the wholesale market, you have the retailers. Those, those are like the electricity companies that are actually selling the contracts to the consumers. 
you have the retail markets, and then you have the consumers. So in that supply chain, what actually dictates the price of electricity in the bills is the generators. But what's interesting is it's in a bidding system. So basically each generator puts in, okay, this is the price to actually make the electricity until the demand is met. So once the demand is met, the most expensive, which is typically a gas company, so usually it would be renewables here, um, something in the middle, maybe like nuclear, and then gas companies down here, the, the most expensive one to fill the demand, that actually sets that wholesale market price. So that's what's very interesting to understand here is the profit. So let's say that whole, that price of gas just skyrockets. Well, the profit of those renewable companies can literally go up 10 times if that price of gas goes up 10 times, right? Because their prices didn't change. But in the overall electricity market, that bidding system, this one is the one that actually dictates that future market price. So it's a futures contract, just like in other derivatives markets. But with this, it's a lot of the other continents don't actually work like this. It's different, the electricity market in Asia, North America, South America, but Europe's is quite interesting in this way. Basically, the reason they structured it this way was to incentivize these renewable companies to kind of lower their costs. And when they do that, they can actually make a lot of profit, you know, based on these other uh, fossil fuel based companies, you know, having it be more expensive. And the problem with this is that's exposing the consumer to the volatility in this market. So. Um, you know, when, when these electricity companies shorted it, also exposing themselves to it, obviously when you gamble in the market. But the problem is a lot of these consumers have floating contracts, right? So if you have a fixed contract, that's actually reflecting the volatility off to the, um, the retail companies who actually, basically they have the contract. So they would maybe sell a fixed contract to a consumer. So let's say you would pay, just for example, in the, in the UK, they, they recently capped the price at 2,500 um, pounds for the year. Um, Liz Truss, the new prime minister, that was kind of one of her first things she did after you know Prime Minister Boris Johnson stepped down. She came in and decided to set those price caps. Now, a lot of the European Union nations are looking to do this. Countries like Spain, for example, say this market is completely unfair. Um, one of the leaders of the, the European Union actually said, you know, the electricity market is no longer a functioning market, um, which is quite interesting to understand because given this current situation in that bidding system where the most expensive, again, that drives the price up. And for example, the renewables, the price didn't change. So if that shoots the price up where on average they were paying around, it was like 70, anything above 75 to 100 euros was considered pretty expensive. Now we actually saw like on August 29th futures to jump up to like over a thousand euros. And the proposal would be maybe to cap it at around 200 euros. Um, that would be per month. Um, but in, in the UK, they decided to move ahead with this 2,500 pounds um, per year. So setting that price cap, essentially what that means is if it goes over a certain threshold, we'll basically pass those profits then on to maybe subsidize um, lower income housing and help them with that. But the main thing you want to understand there is in that kind of queue, that bidding system to fill that demand, when the prices really skyrocket for these fossil fuel companies like gas companies, it's going to reflect in the overall power market price, right? So you have the overall price. That's kind of this idea of separating gas from electricity prices. So hope you understand that. Maybe I'll do a deep dive video specifically on Europe's um, electricity market. But again, for this video, and just kind of wrapping your head around this whole concept of what's going on in Europe. Um, next, we'll move into the new energy paradigm. What's going on here? Um, what the European Union really should do moving forward. The, the most important thing is they should have been being proactive before all these problems occurred. Um, there's not too much you can do now scrambling before the winter. Um, Germany's trying to up their actual uh, gas reserves for this winter. So it'll cost them around $51 billion this year. That's about 10 times the average. Um, usually only cost them about $5 billion to actually fill up these reserves. And they say to have a safe winter, you're gonna need to get these reserves to about 90%. Right now they're about at 80%. Um, a lot of countries really, really depend on this um, this kind of situation where they would think, you know, in, in the summer, you kind of fill up these reserves, and then in the winter, you'll have this um, ready, but it may not work so well this, uh, this winter. So this is kind of the new energy paradigm that I want to talk about is really this focus on what is truly the best form of energy, not just, you know, what is kind of, um, you could say, the, the most uh, woke or like moral thing in the ESG space, um, where we've seen that really that was the main focus in Europe. Now it's coming to, okay, truly at the end of the day, just brass tacks, what's the most important form of energy? What's the most renewable form? I personally think that's nuclear. Nuclear is very, very fascinating. However, to bring these plants online, um, very fast can be tough. Um, some people look to more innovative methods, which are very fascinating. Um, things like thorium, fusion, modular reactors. The problem here is a lot of those for actually them to have the full, um, even just prototype out, it would take five to 10 years. So a lot of these are looking at, they're gonna be ready by 2030. So in the short term, those aren't really a solution. Um, other thing people look to is liquefied natural gas, shipping in LNG. Um, before I think it was like 38% of 
Germany's LNG came from Russia, but now one of the things they're looking at is shipping more from North Africa, so a place like Egypt ship a lot of LNG to Europe. Um, actually, the United States could ship. The problem here is you have to have the infrastructure in Europe just doesn't have the infrastructure in place to actually have the capacity to turn this LNG to a different state. So basically, from the point of export to the point of import, so let's use, for example, in the US, if they were gonna ship to Europe, um, from the point of export from the US, you actually have, have to have very expensive um, industrial facilities to turn these, this liquefied natural gas into a different state, then ship it, and you have to have expensive containers, very important technology. Um, then in the point of import, so it, when you actually arrive in Europe, you also have kind of about the same technology. Um, you have to have a lot of infrastructure to then change it back into liquefied natural gas, back into a different state, um, and then ship it through the pipelines um, across Europe. So very, very complex. You also have coal. Now, obviously, Europe's having to go back to coal. Not a good thing. This is not a good thing for the environment. And just, you know, it's kind of a short-term solution, but it's actually going to be very, very important this winter. Um, coal and firewood, it, it sounds like, you know, we're in the 80s and 90s, but it's just one of those things where I think Europe kind of got got over their skis a bit on this ESG change and didn't really focus enough on having this infrastructure in place just in case something like this happened. That's where nuclear is incredibly important. Um, beyond that, if we're looking at solutions, some people would say, okay, you know, renewables are great. Now, the problem with renewables, I talked about earlier in this video, is they're intermittent, right? So you need a secondary power source. Um, then if you're actually going to try and, like, let's say, store the energy. So when there's wind, when there's sun, then store that energy for when you're going to need it. The problem is you need these mega batteries that take a lot of lithium, a lot of commodities. Um, to actually create. And with these batteries, only a tiny percent of the actual energy capacity can be stored there. So it's not really just a feasible option moving forward. Um, so when it comes to actually producing more electricity, this is the state we're in, right? So we, we can look to these innovative options, but really what Europe is going to have to focus on this, this winter is less consumption, right? So you can focus on more production, supplying more electricity, or you can look at just using less electricity. And that's gonna be the main thing. Um, for example, looking at things like what are the percentage of cars in traffic with just one passenger in them, potentially looking for other options there with carpool and busing, um, looking at buildings that maybe should be using something like geothermal. So to kind of tap into the, uh, the intermittent actual like earth temperature um, to help de use less electricity for buildings. Um, there's a lot of other things you can do is, for, for example, looking at the percentage of buildings across the European Union that has good insulation where you need less um, heating or cooling. Also looking at things like um, at night, lights that maybe are used or places that are heating, heated or cooled where there's no actual humans there. Um, that's pretty insane. For example, Switzerland is one of these countries that came out and basically talked about uh, proposing this idea that anyone that heated their house over, I think it was 19 degrees Celsius, so about 66 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm actually like jailing them. So a lot of these countries are going to extreme measures um, in this way. Uh, the UK has done a lot of things in, in this similar, but it'll be interesting to kind of see how these countries move forward with this, you know, building this um, new innovation in nuclear. I'll probably do a video just specifically on nuclear and focusing on uranium investing. I've talked about this in the past, but I hope you understand all of that throughout this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, any comments, let me know in the comments below. Um, I'll definitely be making more videos going deep into different individual kind of narratives in this overall energy crisis and what's really turning into a cost of living crisis. So thank you very much for watching. As always, invest global.